I'm Katie Fioka, um, and I'm not sure how many of you are super familiar with Quick Deck, so I'm going to give you the elevator pitch part of that first, and then um, we'll back it up to who I am and how I got this journey. At Cookie Text, what we do is we take your special message, your text message, and we make it a little bit sweeter by putting it on a piece of paper. Everything we do is made from scratch. It's all baked to order. Uh, you can order as late as 9 o'clock the night before online, and we'll have a fresh product out the next day. Uh, of course, you can order for future dates. It doesn't have to be the next day. Um, we like to treat every order like it's the and so if Mallory sent one to Nancy, um, I would want Mallory to think that that was the only cookie we could serve that whole entire day and not know that we had 25 other ones that were out for delivery. Uh, I think the key to that is consistency and doing things the same um, and not treating our customers like avatars, even though most of our orders are online. Um, and to back it up, I was raised in Hampton, Virginia, uh, youngest of 11 kids, big Catholic family. Um, and of the era that once you turn 18, you're on your own. And so I knew that all my peers were going to college, so that's what I was going to do. And I picked something. Um, went to school in New York for a couple of years, up in upstate New York, and then ended up coming back here for home. Um, the little tidbit in there is um, that, and I think that this, people are like, how do you get your drive? How come you don't quit? I think um, my mom passed away when I was going into fourth grade, so August before fourth grade. So there's that horrible thing where you go into your fourth grade classroom, and it was back in the day where there weren't many divorced parents, and the teachers always reference, bring this home to your mom, bring this home to your mom. And I'm like, oh, I got an A.M., bring it home to my And you're like, Crest. And so it just was a, a good bit of heartache, pretty young. Um, then my freshman year of college, when I was up in New York, uh, my dad passed away of cancer. And so then I was really, truly on my own. And it was, you know, you got to get it done. So Mallory just said, once you graduate from ODU, you with? I said, whatever would get me out in four years. So while I was here, um, going to school, I was living in Hampton, and I was working my, my way through school. I worked in, um, you know, a nightclub. I worked as a hostess at Rockola back in the day. Um, when I was in New York, I worked in a fish market. I was a coat girl. I, you name it, I've been a lifeguard. Um, and I laugh because I look back, and everybody's like, I don't want to take that job. It's not the field I'm going into. And I'm like, take every job, because you will learn something from everything. Uh, when I was in New York and worked in the fish market, uh, I, I guarantee you everything I learned about sanitation and cleanliness, I have put to work at Cookie Text. So I don't be picky and choosy. Do what you gotta do to make money to get through school or do whatever you have to do, um, because you will learn something from every experience, even if it's how to deal with a crappy boss or how to work hard and not rest at home. So I. I finished ODU and I took a year of taking prerequisite classes um, that I wanted for grad school. And I went up to Richmond and got my master's degree in occupational therapy. And so I worked in stroke and brain injury rehab for about three years after I graduated before I had my sons. Um, I got three boys. Um, they are now, I don't drive them around as much anymore because they are now 15, 15, and 14. And by the end of the month, uh, end of April, they'll be 18, 16, 14. I'll have two drivers. One going off to college. The occupational therapy is funny because I, I stayed home with the boys. And I was the queen of volunteer. You name it, I did it. I, I ran a chess club, didn't know how to play chess. I was the Weeble Oak Scout Den leader. I was the church group elder. I was the children's ministry leader. I worked on the PTA hospitality committee and for some reason thought one year during pollen season it would be great to wash all the teachers' cardboard. <laughs> not good, not good. So 
my youngest went to school, and I'm realizing that this volunteerism is becoming more like being voluntold to do stuff, and I'm being treated like an employee, even though I'm not really an employee. And I thought, not only that, it's starting to cost my family money, because of course we're supposed to turn in all these receipts, but I'm going right before chess club to get 40 snacks, and I'm throwing a receipt in the my purse, and not only am I not making money for the family, I'm also kind of costing us money with these extra things. And during that time, I also had started making my children's birthday cakes. Um, it started, I have a stepdaughter who is 27 now, but, uh, <laughs> and um, it started when she was quite young that I started making cakes, because we didn't have store-bought cakes when I was growing up. I mean, it was mom got a box of Duncan Hines or Betty Crocker, and you had what she made in the oven, and I thought, that was delicious, so why are we buying all these cakes? And what I realized was, a lot of it was because my stepdaughter was into things that, she didn't just want a cake, she wanted a cake with you on it, or Choco, or Hello Kitty, or something like that. And a few of the things she was into, she was like, always a trendsetter, she was into them before, like, um, like a screen shop, or, or whatever would offer that character on a cake. And so I started, you know, trying to do it. And then when my youngest came along, I was then it was fun to try to make a cake that looked like a construction truck or I we did this. And you can have y'all played Crash Bandicoot or Spyro? Yeah. Oh my gosh. We had a Spyro birthday with the big old egg. We did a blues blues, <laughs> you name it. I made R2 D2 one year. And then all of a sudden I started making them for friends. Friends started asking. And that was super cool because I liked doing stuff like that for people that when they got their birthday cake, they were like, oh wow, oh and Miss Jeannie made it for you. And that was just super cool. It was a way of me being able to give, but I realized I will never make any money in this case. I was slow as molasses. And that's where the occupational therapy came in because you look at activities and how long they take and whether or not, I'm telling you what, if, if I was selling cakes, you better paint it by the hour, not the piece, because it took me a long time. They were always lovely in the end, more or less, but it was not going to be anything that I could do anything. So time for me to go back to work, and I go to the interview at an occupational therapy place. And I walk in, and it's a Riverside company, and I was a Riverside employee before, but it was just a different location. And I would have had to work a certain number of hours in order to renew my licensure. And I walked in there and I could smell the smells and I could see the people in the wheelchairs and I could feel all that the, that I felt, you know, 10, 12 years ago when I was in there. And I couldn't get out of there fast enough. And I realized this isn't me anymore. This isn't what I want to do with my time. This is, I have become somebody different between chess club and doing the scouts and I found this creative stuff that I didn't know I had in me. I mean, in chess club, I taught all the kids the different um, pieces and they would compete in chess and we had like the final four look at the bracket and I'm going to great work. And then for the last meeting of the year, I would go into the gym early and I would tape a chess board on the floor and they would come in half of them in black and half of them in white and they'd have the code for the chess piece and they would do live action chess. And this is not the same person that is going to be changing the diaper of an 86 year old man that had a stroke and is trying to teach him how to put his clothes back on. That did not bring me the joy that I got watching these kids be active and do things. And so I think a big piece of it was me realizing what brought me happiness, what brought me joy, and realizing that I think in my fiber of my being, that there are givers and there are takers in this world. And I'm a giver. Um, I will preclude that by saying, or whatever word it is I'm trying to find, I will say that uh, I'm a giver to you expect something. <laughs> I don't know that. But you know how some people like, when you expect more than I've already offered you, then I get a little bit more. But anyway, you give her a taker. And so, I ran out of that OT job interview and was like, I cannot do this. I cannot go back to doing this. And what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I knew I had a knack for the baking, 
But going back to the OT part, I knew that it wasn't measurable. The cakes were not measurable because it had gotten from how I made like a sheet cake with a picture on the top to, you know, I'm having to put rods in a cake and wrap it in fondant and cut out little things for strawberry shortcake. And it wasn't measurable. I didn't figure out a way that, I couldn't see a way that it would be measurable and I could do enough business or produce enough items to make it profitable at all. And I realized that one thing that was different was if somebody called me and said, hey, Jeannie, can you make my daughter's cake? I'd be like, Ugh. and they'd say, we just want a cookie cake. And I'd be like, yes, cookie cakes are black. That you don't build them up in stacks and stacks and stacks. You don't drape them in fondant. You don't worry that they're going to tip over and fall when you move from one place to the other. And you don't worry that, like, oh my gosh, I didn't grease the pan enough and it didn't come out. And so I was like, I've got to do something. One day I thought, what about if just here locally we put like a message on a cookie cake so we could order online? And it was basically, you know, a cookie gram. Well, this was before Instagram. And I thought gram came from telegram, which was the things that people sent back in the war, and nobody would know what I meant if I said cookie gram. And I was like, well, now when people pass words back and forth, it's really text. And so I was like, how about cookie text? This could be something that I'm thinking in my head. And quite honestly, I'm a big, did you know yesterday was National Napping Day? I'm a big fan of a nap. I'm like a professional for that. Like I could, yeah, I could sleep. You'd be so jealous. So anyway, I was taking a nap and I shot up for my nap and I was like, an edible tweet. Cookie text, an edible tweet. And so I thought, that's it. That's the business and the tagline. And that was in late April, early May of 2011. And I saw a meme yesterday where somebody said, an entrepreneur has an idea, and one year later, they have a business. A entrepreneur has an idea, and one year later, they still have an idea. But I'll tell you what, if you want somebody chomping at you, have, a, have an idea for a business with three young boys in because I felt like May to October, because it was May that I got the idea, October that my, we delivered our first product. Um, I thought that was pretty fast considering, not to my children. Oh, kids, kids just want something the next minute. Mom, you're doing it yet. So I didn't take a single business class while I was here. I've worked in several businesses, but I had no open idea of what I was doing. And I think that the internet is even more helpful now than it was in 2011. It's a lot easier to find information. The wealth of information you can get from podcasts alone will blow you away. So you have, I could sit there and listen to the gal that invented Spanx talk about how she launched her product. It's just unbelievable to me. Um, it's amazing to me what people are willing to share, and I love it. But so I went to the internet to figure out you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg, I need my business license or my LLC or my what What do I do, how do I do this? And I just kept plugging forward. And meanwhile, I'm also trying to talk to this friend about doing a logo and I'm also trying to get the website built. And then I'm going online and I did the math. I was like, I finally got everything I was going to use. And I did the math and divided it up against, uh, would, could I deliver one of these for around 20 bucks? and have any margin at all. And I did the math one day, and I just shut the door and was like, well, there was that idea. Because I can't do it, because I'm not going to make any money. There's no money. And then the next day, I went back and I did the math right. <laughs> <laughs> because I did bad math. So yes, the next day, I did the math right. Uh, a big trick, and one of the keys to my business is that uh, I knew from the occupational therapy piece that everything had to have structure and I knew you could look at all the different steps. And the key for me was finding a pan that went from the refrigerator to the oven to the customer because that cuts out a lot of steps. And then I had to find a pan that did that that wasn't hideous too because the first one I got looked like the paper plate. And so that was the, once I found that, it, it, I was like, okay, now we're, 
Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar at all with um, a lot of those of us that want to bathe or that do any kind of food stuff. It's very tricky to figure out how to do it out of your home or if you can do it out of your home. And so I did initially start in the back of a like a Philly pretzel factory that's over there um, in uh, Yorktown, and later moved to my garage. And the garage eventually got fully approved. There may have been a little bit of uh, it's better to beg forgiveness and ask permission. There might have been a little part in there where we were making a transition because the pretzel place closed, and I was like, okay, we can we can do what we can do, but then we'll fix it. <laughs> but um, that said, there were a lot of moments in that May to September time that I was like, how the heck am I going to do this? I have no idea money-wise what this is going to be. You know, I don't know how to manage money right. I don't know how to get the business license. What comes first? What, this, what the hell is MEIN? These kind of things. And you know what I thought about? The thing that oddly got me through was I'm not like a super primper, but I did occasionally get my nose done. If I was going on vacation, I didn't want my feet looking ratchet, so I would get my nose done. And I sat there and I thought, I have never once gone into a nail salon where the people had English as their first language. If the people that are coming overseas and starting businesses in the US that don't speak English as their native language can open a nail salon. Surely, with a master's degree, I can figure this out. <laughs> and it's the dumbest things sometimes that make you go, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can figure that out. And so that got me through. And literally, the day I went to the county and needed to get my business license, and they're like, you need this number from this. And I pulled out that paper. You need this number from this. And I pulled out that paper. You need it. I literally was like, go and ask Carly, I did it. I did it. I, 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 I did it. I got it. And it's just all these little things that you're like, oh my gosh. Because so um anyway, we started in October of eleven. October third of eleven. I had one flavor and one size. And now we have six flavors four sizes. People can add balloons, they can do a party pack, they can add extra frosting, they can add candles. Um, we have grown every year. Um, and the Valentine's Day is, I mean the holidays are great for us, but Valentine's Day is the day for us. And this year on Valentine's Day, um, usually the website cuts the orders off at 9 o'clock. You can't order for the next day after and at 7.30 the night before, um, I went in and I shut down the day for any more orders. So I, we hit what I felt finally was absolute capacity and couldn't go. But I was like, no, we had seven drivers on the road. I think I slept two hours. But um, I know two things for absolute sure in life. One is that my children are loved. And the other is that I absolutely love my job. And if there's something that I can share with you about that, it's that love what you're trying to do. Because there are moments where I'm in that situation and I'm working so hard and doing so much, and I am tired, but I think, what if I was doing something I didn't like? What if I had created something that became successful and I was miserable doing it? And so that's not the case for me. I mean, sure, there are things that I always say to myself, dang, we're going to get a little bigger, I'm never going to fill another piping bag. We're going to get a little bigger, and I'm never going to wash another dish. But the vast majority of what I do, I absolutely love. And I love it because it's a wonderful fit for me because I get to be a little bit creative each day. Granted, there's a standard like text message, but people ask for different pictures on there, and I'll do whatever you ask and put it on there. Um, the customer service piece is huge because um, people are often driven to thank us. The senders are often driven to thank us. And to me, that is a win because I feel like they believe they're getting more than they pay for. 
And I believe that they're getting a, a great, great value. Um, I think between customer service and providing an ex exceptional product, that's what makes us stand out. Um, and we're consistent. You know, you get, you know, every time it's the, if your text arrives, it's got a little ribbon, it looks more like a gift than anything else. There's, you open it up, there's like a little napkin and a knife in the box, um, a little bit of tissue paper to make it a little bit more peppy. Um, and so, good friends and good friends. So, um, that's kind of the background of the text. I'm going to um, look over here at what some of the lessons I've learned. Um, <laughs> the one was the same thing with the nail salon is that uh, you can do it. I mean, lesser people have done bigger things. And they're, I mean, you just keep the one foot in front of the other. And whatever, you know, several, several, several. Totally. Um, something I believe firmly is if you mess up, mess up. I am not perfect at my job. I am lucky that it is only two weeks and that it's not like I'm a brain surgeon or something. But what I do differently than I do a lot of businesses, so I don't know if any of you are dealt with contractors or trying to get loads and doing the right thing at the right time. Um, a lot of it is passing the luck. I don't ever blame my employees. I take on full responsibility. So if for some reason there was a glitch and your cookie didn't get there or it was oddly the wrong flavor, I tell you right away, hey, I take full responsibility. I'll take care of it. I'll credit you this cookie. I'll go with your next one for free. I make it right. I go out of my way to make it right because I would rather keep that customer than try to stand on your or whatever. I don't I don't use excuses like um, Oh, it's our busiest day of the year. Oh, well, you know, it's just, I'm sorry, it should have been right, and I'll make it right. Um, and that kind of takes people aback. And so a lot of people that I have messed up with are end up being the best customer because they then trust your integrity and believe that you're going to do your best to do the right thing. Um, learn what sells and what doesn't. I cannot tell you um, the money wasted for me on printing. If I put cookie text in a newspaper or if I have on the back of a picture, it does nothing for me. If I show up at an event like a Taste of York or a vendor fair or a five day race and I have cookie samples and some flyers where they just take pictures of the item or I'm standing there talking, that sells. Print ads, I might as well just take my money and throw it in the river. Um, and along those lines, Everything you do that leads up to your business matters. My very first customer were the people that I was connected to on social media that I had either led their kid in chess club or had taught their child in children's literacy or I was their scout family leader. Those people were the ones that were my first customers because their experience with Jeannie was that, well, when Jeannie said that she was going to take the kids on this camping trip, she did, and everybody got their safe. When Jeannie said that she was going to have all those forms turned in so we could have the t-shirts on time, she did. Those were the same people that were willing to gamble their 25 bucks on me. When I said, I've got this product, I think it's good. So everything you do leading up to, it, it talks to your character, and those are the people that are willing to you know, either say, I believe in you, or actually shell out some money and say, I'm going to give it a whirl. You know? um, one thing I truly believe, and it's hard in this context because I, I know you all want to hear about me and my story, um, is that we is better than I. Um, I have a, a really great team that I work with, um, and we is better than I am for a lot of reasons. One is that um, there's a simple principle in life that if I really love this candy bar and I give you a light, you share the joy of the candy bar and it makes it all much better for me. But there's also that sense from the business perspective of let's all be in this. And so I think that when my delivery people or my gal that works on my books or my web designer or um, the gal that makes the cookie dough, 
it out and people know that there are remains of sheep that I fetch. They take some ownership in that and they take pride in that. And I don't ever say, like, I did a great Valentine's Day. I say, we did it. And I could not do it without them. It helps them be invested and it helps me realize that I totally cannot do it without the sheep. And it's so much more fun to look at Liz at the end of Valentine's Day and say, holy crap, can you believe we pulled off that many orders? That was awesome. And to have somebody to share the success with is just amazing. I mean, it's so much more fun and joyful. And um, I truly believe what everybody says about the attitude of gratitude and being thankful. I am just very grateful for the team that I have and how hard they work. And um, it's great to have people share I, yeah, come from a place of yes, but you also gotta learn to say no. And so when somebody says, would you do like this for my, um, this kind of cookie treats for my wedding or, yes, it has something to do with my real house. Now, if somebody says, would you like a cake for my wedding, a real cake? I said yes to that way too many times. And that's out of my real house now. It, it literally stops all my production of cookie decks and I have to focus on this thing that's totally different and not, it's okay to say no. And I do think, I mean, there are, I don't know if gentlemen have the same challenge as women do. I know as a mother and as a woman that no is sometimes very hard for me to say. I think that we sometimes think too much about what other people think. And um, I, I'm learning very, uh, I'm learning to say no and realize that's a complete sentence. No, and, and, and it's done and not a million excuses or what or that one. Thank you for thinking of me, but no. <laughs> so um, but I say come from a place of, of yes because sometimes ideas are spurred there. You know, if somebody says can you can you make these for my wedding, well that might be my next product that all of a sudden I'm offering two hundred mini treat bags or would you ever consider making candy? Well now we have a, a rotating cookie flavor, we call it we call it the cookie text WTF, what's the flavor? And so occasionally we introduce a new flavor and you know when somebody says we make snickerdoodle, one month we made it snickerdoodle and another month we made it pumpkin spice and you know sometimes your customers have better ideas than you do. Um, so it's important to, um, <coughs> this is kind of backtracking. Um, <coughs> You're not the smartest person in the room. You know, it's hard. I, I think it's hard sometimes to realize that that people can bring something because I think this is my baby. Cookie text is my baby, and I don't. I you know I'm the queen. But it goes with the whole um, back to the if you mess up, you mess up. I think a lot of people get defensive when they mess up, and one of the best things I've heard about that is that pain is not a hobby. You don't take pain and throw it right back at somebody. And you don't want to take an idea and throw it right back at somebody. You know, if somebody had a good idea, sometimes it feels uncomfortable and you're like, why is this uncomfortable? Maybe because I wish I should have thought of it myself. If somebody said, well, you screwed up my order, it hurts. You don't want to not be good at your job. And so when you have those uncomfortable feelings in business, I think it's important to sit down for a minute and not just, you know, and, and, and because they can be the greatest source of growth and new ideas. Oh, what else we got? Um, I actually really love what we do. Um, oh, this is the worst advice ever, but I gotta say it. Figure out how to manage the money. You know, find some way. I'm terrible at money. I don't like dealing with money. Uh, but you've got to do it, and I understand there are things that you, when you're in a lot of business, know what you can learn and what you need to pay somebody else to do, and do one or the other with the money. Figure it out. If you have to pay somebody else to figure out the money part, then do that. So I, right now I pay a bookkeeper, I have a tax accountant. I have, I don't have to do too much with the money part. But I would have been a lot better shape if I had stayed more on top of it and got one system. I think I, I switched the bookkeeping systems online like three different times. It was a nightmare. It's not a good idea. Um, 
So you'll figure it figure it out because it's not fun. And it's not good if you have to take sales taxes if you want to make sure that you're paying them. Um and the other thing that Mallory asked me to make sure that I covered was um, the success that I'm most proud of. Um, the success I'm most proud of is honestly my sons. Um, and, and Cookie Tech plays in that uh, more than one way. Um, I've raised boys that I like to be around. I really enjoy them. They're good guys. They're fun. They're, um, you know, but they're not like all about mom either. And I let them have mom their space. Um, I went into a partnership with uh, Max Media, the radio station that has Top 100 and uh, The Eagle and 92.9. And so we had a barter where I would provide cookie cakes for their salespeople to go take on their sales calls. In exchange, I got airtime. And it's still going on. I think we were on um, 97 degrees last week from that. And so there were weeks at a time that my ad would run. And we happened to be coming home from Williamsburg. And my 15 year old was in the front seat. And I was driving down the road. And Eagle 97 was on. And the local business spotlight with me on it came on the radio. And I'm looking to the right. And here's my son. And I see him. And he hears him. And he goes, Yes! And that's the kind of moment that I feel like, wow, like that whole our team score kind of thing. And whatever becomes of cookie text, it's a success because I've taught my kids that life isn't Shark Tank. It's not American Idol where you're an overnight success. They have watched their mom take a word. I own the word now. I've had a trademark. It's on their friends' shirts because I sponsor their soccer team. They've watched their mom take an idea and a word into a full-fledged business. And it's something that they're proud of. Um, they are happy to take a cookie cake to the friend's house. They'll ask me, can I have one for well, such and such a future? teacher? Um, that they've watched that transpire and seen what it takes to, what, how much of myself I had to put into it, how much time it has taken, um, that is probably my greatest success with cookie text is, is feeling like it also served to show my sons a great lesson in um, not just hard work, doing the right thing, you know, just being inconvenienced by a job sometimes, having other commitments, and then producing something that, you know, they're proud to say. Because of granted, the, first, the older two were like middle school when I launched. They were a little hands off at first. They were a little embarrassed. They were not going to be wearing that cookie text hoodie that I, I bought the first go around. Now they're like, I don't know what cookie hoodie you want on. And they got two soccer buddies that won't take their off, theirs off. And so um, I'm proud of what I've done as a mother, and I'm very proud of what they've learned from this. Um, I do have big dreams for cookie text. I do want to franchise, I want to go big. I think that um, it's all in time because right now, like even this past summer, there were moments that my kids still needed me as available as I am. Um, and I think that you know the youngest will be in high school, the oldest will be off to college, and I do believe that our growth will kind of happen exponentially as they phase out of out of the household. Um, that's kind of my story. Any questions? Any? All right, so you're talking about your boys. Yes. Do any of them have any interest? I know it's early for some of them, but have they shown any interest in taking it to one? Absolutely zero. 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 They would like to be professional case testers, and that's about it. Um, this is not like, you know, you want to paint the picture of like, oh, yeah, my kids are in here helping me. No. no. I will force them to help sometimes, like, if I have like, a thousand samples to prep for a case of William Morris thing or a bunch of stickers. But mine are the very, uh, they're good boys, but they're also kind of that little spoiled and kind of, they want to be in there playing Fortnite and all that other stuff and not helping me in the food kitchen. So I've had to do as much as, you know, 
threatened to take off their phones and get the oldest one to go do the dishes. And I'm like, I'm not going to give you any more cash money. Go do those dishes. But, yeah, no, I'm just going to So, I don't know what will happen, but not Okay, can you talk about uh, getting your first team member and, like, how that? Oh, team member. Ah, a lot of, most of what I've done is word of mouth and talking to friends. Um, so the very first person that worked with me was a girlfriend. And then I just didn't have enough hours early on and she needed more, so she left. And uh, the gal that has been with me the most, most frequently, or, pardon me, for the longest time is a gal named Liz, who is actually, she has a son that's only a year older than mine, but had him later in life. So she actually probably 15 years older than me and just loved to cook. And I had a, a mutual friend that kept saying, oh, you should ask Liz. She loves to bake. You should ask Liz. You should ask Liz. And the trick with my job or my employment is you work when I need you. And people are like, that will never work. And, and it does work because some people want to do that. Some people don't want to have to go. Okay, so most of my um, employees are moms that used to stay home with their kids. Not all of those moms want to go from being a stay-at-home mom to working eight to five. They have grown used to that flexibility in their day or having some hours to get stuff done. So if I tell somebody when they come to work for me, okay, typically if you're a delivery driver, you're going to work between 10 and 2. Um, and we don't have anybody working for five days. We have one driver who works three days, one work, you know. So, one guy was like, okay, so you'll work three days a week. It's typically 10 to 2. Some days it'll be longer. If we're really slow, I might send you a text the next night before and say I got it covered. Because I'm telling you what, we were crazy for Christmas, but the first week of January, it was like, ooh, if I have less than five, I'm taking them. I'm not going to pay you to come in because it's costing me more to have you deliver them than I'm making off of the companies. So um, I did have a bad employee experience. Um, I hired somebody, and it was just because they kept asking me, kept asking me. Um, and I hired them, and they just didn't have that, don't get by. You know, um, you know, people are like bright and sunshiny, and then you know, you know, any Eeyores in your life? Wah, wah, wah. And, and so my driver now is like, oh my gosh, I delivered that one today, and they And this guy was like, wah, wah. and it was just not a good fit. And ultimately, something happened that I was like, I can't. Um, but a lot of it for me has been word of mouth. I have not had a lot of success at all with um, hiring somebody I didn't know, especially since they're coming into my home. Um, they either have to come in my home to pick up a cookie or to work in my kitchen or what have you. And so I am very judicious in making sure that it's somebody that, you know, if my kids are home, they're going to be comfortable around this person as well. I think it adds a little different bit of dynamic. Yeah, yeah, I was just curious because, uh, well, my business, I make candles. Uh -huh. I, smell I saw them, they smell amazing. Thank you. But so, uh, and so, like, I'm the same way. Like, Christmas is ridiculous. Yeah. The whole, like, from November to the end of the month, it's like ridiculous. And then, like, January, it's like slow. Valentine's Day is big, Mother's Day is big. But other than that, it's like, and so I, it was just like, how do you, like, find that, but I guess you said like moms. Like, yeah, and the other thing too, and I was mentioning it earlier to Nancy, is be out in the world. Like, be out in the world and meet people. And and I tell you what, on on Valentine's Day, I needed seven drivers. Well, I don't typically have, it, have it seven drivers. And so I had to have some come in that, you know, it might have been their first day, it might have been their second day, and I know people that know people. You know, and so I can call my friend Carlin and go, you got anybody? And she knows the whole flipping world. Right. And she's like, okay, here's the number. She's available that day. And Carlin's somebody I trust. So this girl was a gem. You know, she wouldn't send me anybody. I think the more you're honest with people and say, hey, you know, I really need help for about a month. You want to make some extra money for a month. And, da, 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 da. Or, and then if they work out well, say, hey, we get busy again around such and such a time. And so, if, if you're available, then I'd love to use you. And you got to make it worth your while, right, yeah. you know, which is tricky too because that's eating your bottom line. But you know, 
know, I think it, it, that's the thing. If I'm honest with the employees, like sometimes it works, sometimes it won't. But by the same token, one of my drivers is going over to England in May to see the royal wedding. And she's like, I'm sorry, I'm going to be gone so long. And I'm like, that's why you have this kind of job. Because you give me the warning, I'll figure out somebody to fill in for you. And your spot will be here when you come back. And, you know, that it's a little bit of give and take. And it's worked out better than I thought, um, being up front and hey, I don't need you tomorrow, but you had a question back there? Yeah, I was going to ask that because I have the same problem. Because uh, my job is more seasonal. I uh, usually try to do most stuff by myself. Sometimes I need a partner. Yeah. And uh, uh, I do lawn care landscaping, so I just need some hands sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I ask some of my neighbors, uh, some kids go to high school where uh, sometimes I ask them, I'll be like, you know, summer's coming up, I may need your help. Would you be willing to help me? I pay you by the job, not by the hour, because I get paid by the job. So I, so I tell them, you know, up front, what you get from me when you, when you work with me. So sometimes I may go and knock on my neighbor's door. I'm like, hey, I got some yard. I got, I got 10 yards to cut. I need your help uh, Wednesday morning. Will you be available? I pay you $10 a yard. So he already knows what he's going to make. So it's up to him to move fast and me to move fast so we can be done in five or six hours. So, and I always tell don't be afraid to tell me no. Because yeah, I can I, take a no. I, I can take a no that. better than I'll tell you tomorrow and I'll tell you tomorrow and I still haven't plugged anybody into that yeah. spot that I need. So just, hey, I can take no for an answer. Just let me know and move on. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you have uh, secret recipes for your cookie. And if so, how do you do that with your team? If you have a secret recipe. I really don't. I don't share the recipes publicly um, with like the internet or anything like that. But to be perfectly honest, our trick is we use real butter for everything. You know, that's the big difference. That's the selling point. People aren't used to real butter. They're used to getting the Walmart cake or the mall cookie cake where they're scraping the lard off the roof of their mouth. And so, honestly, um, all we're really doing different is making it from scratch with real butter. And so there's not anything to worried about. I have in the past had some relations with um, different people that were consulting me on my business. And I, I had to, I filled out a non-disclosure agreement that basically said, you know, what happens to your state here or what information you glean from here. And most people, if somebody balks at a non-disclosure agreement, then you don't want to be with them anyway. You know, if somebody feels like, well, if they feel threatened by it for some reason, then that's not who you need to be with. You need to be with somebody who goes, oh, you know, if this was my idea, I'd want to be with you too. Or if this was my thing, I'd want to be, you know. So I uh, don't get, I mean, you can print a non-disclosure agreement up off the internet and fill in the key parts that you need. And a lot of the time, I mean, you won't ever have to enforce it. It's going to be somewhere you're just glad you have it on hand. There's an understanding that, you know. But I do have a pep talk with my employees because there are familiar names that come through. And I'm like, you can't be telling somebody that we sent a cookie out to John Bloom that had his appendix out because John Bloom might not want everybody to know he got his appendix out. So there is a little bit of let's just, you know, be respectful that this is people's privacy. I have a question and then a comment. Um, so let me just do my comment first because it's quicker. Okay. Um, maybe Stroh could have a place where these guys can advertise if they need help. So if there was a place online that you can check as a student that you can help, you know, five or ten hours a week or three hours a week, whatever, then once people got used to that, it could be advertising daily announcements. I think that would be good for these guys oh. and good for students. Well, uh, the club, they actually have, um, and I've actually got some uh, potential folks like in the city you know, working with me, but they have a spreadsheet. And so they let all the they give all the entrepreneurs access to it. They can pretty much print like your your company's name, contact email, and then like the position you need. But then like the, your struggle with me was like, well, if they're saying, Oh, I, I need some extra money and I want to work for like fifteen hours a week, and I'm like, Well, I might only need you for like five hours one day, you know. So it's like how do you And, and that's the thing where I said just be up front. Right. Say I can't I can't promise you fifteen hours a week. I can give you what I have and they jump on it or not. And that's the same thing with the, the drivers. It's like, hey, you know, typically I need to tend to one or two. Sometimes I won't. And they get used to the 
the Bible. There was someone here coming off me and liked my daughters because we right. the Bible. <laughs> this was right. yeah. um, and then the question for you is just, uh, I was wondering if you were working out of your house, and it sounds like you are, but that you expanded. Do you have two kitchens, or? I have one kitchen um, in my garage. So my garage is basically a commercial kitchen. Um, you walk in, in the there. residential space. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I approved by the county, and then for Baker's, it's the Department of Agriculture. And it was a trip in that. I mean, literally had to write down every single step of every single everything. Um, but they were great because when they did come to inspect, I got that like I was terrified. But what I realized was they're not coming to to be horrible. They're coming to make sure people are safe. And that's really and, and, and if they think they're doing something that could be safer, they're going to tell you what to do. But they came in my the young lady came in my garage and she was like, okay, we're good. Because you imagine what they see. And you know we had I mean ours looks like a commercial kitchen. I mean, three dip sink and the big stainless steel fridge and the freezer and the stainless, you know, and everything's up off the floor. And it's, it's did you fall under cottage industry or not cottage industry? So oh, I don't even know if I can remember. Did you pay fees or what the fees were? I paid 40 a year. All right. Um, so, Paul, another question. Did you like bootstrap this or was, was there any funding? Yeah. Um, I've since divorced, but my husband had like a car hobby. He was in mortgage banking and is in mortgage banking. And, and there was a time where that was very successful. And he picked up a hobby of having extra cars. And so when I came up with the idea of cookie tax, I was like, can I have like basically the price of one of these cars? And so in my mind, I got I took 10 grand from the house. Uh, and that's all I've ever paid. Um, that's all I ever used. That bought my website, my computer, my initial product. Um, since then, that was 2011. Since then, um, I've always had my head work. I've never taken another loan. I can always pay my employees. There's more money in the bank now than there was for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, grown and as we've grown, we figured out where the waste was, and so, um, and quite honestly, you know, life happened. So last year, I felt like our growth was less, but I was okay with that because I literally moved my kitchen and my life and left, you know, towards my husband. And as long as I kept my head and my company above water and we had a little bit of growth, I was like, and so sometimes, I mean, I would have moments in the summertime where I was like, oh, I'm not doing well last year, and I'm like, Open line because you have your whole kitchen and nobody can know. Right. You know, and you are figuring this out and just don't be so damn hard on yourself. Uh -huh. So, I mean, just because you can't, nobody's an island. Your business is an island. You're not making your candles and not living a life as well. I mean, everything intersects. And so, yeah, so basically, um, I started with 10 grand and I never officially paid that back. Um, I just, it was a Thing, and then um, we've been independent since then. Do you buy your ingredients at like Costco? Yes, yes, because I've looked at the um, like U.S. foods and all that stuff, and it really is not worth it. The difference. Um, I do most my boxes and pans and stuff. I order online. I checked out Riverside Paper that was local, and they didn't have really what I was using in the field. So if it's Non-food, I'm typically buying it um, online, boxes and packaging and you line I sell one of your ears and little and stuff. But food, it's uh, I'll really go to Sam's Club more than um, a funny quick story is the Sam's Club in North was closing. And my friend was in there and I was like, they got any chocolate chips? Oh my gosh, if you scroll back on my Instagram, you can see me. <laughs> I have so many chocolate chips because they're 25% off. And I know I went through them, but literally in the Sam's Club parking lot, I had to get a body weight behind it. the cart. I think it was 132 bags of the big 72 ounce ones. So that's the thing is you strike all the iron top. Yeah. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask y'all to find me on social media, follow me, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, tell your friends. Um, 
that's how I grow in the body. Meet people and have some conversations. Tell me. How did you go from your first, you know, the people, your inner circle that bought your first sale in um, online disclosure? Um, it was actually 2011, Facebook was quite different. You know, now, if I'm, as a business, I want something to be seen. It has to be really, really interesting, or I have to pay for it. Back then, that wasn't the case. People that were my first customers were kind of sharing pictures and mentioning it. And so I remember thinking, I can't wait till I get a order from somebody I can't wait to get a order. And I was looking at my laptop one night, and I was in my bed, and an order came through from somebody I didn't know, and I was in the here. And that was really like the beginning of it was people sharing on social media and mentioning it and talking about it. And then um, I started getting out at like 5K radio sharing cookie text and people would be like, oh, we're going to work. You know, uh, social media was huge for us, huge for us at, at the beginning. Um, it's still big and it's still good. I don't think I utilize it as well as I should. Um, the other thing I'm saying, use your gifts. I am a decent writer, and one way that I help the company is I write blog posts, and it helps keep my Google rankings up because there's new content on my blog, and there's people going to the website that aren't necessarily buying, and people worry about conversions, and I'm worried less about conversions. Just, like, just keep putting good out there and do it coming back. So, yeah, I do remember the moment when I got that first word from somebody. And <laughs> All right, one last question. We'll wrap it up. Um, what is your favorite cookie to date? Like the coolest one or the most unique one, whatever it is. Oh, I I like the ones where people actually branch out and say something that's like very like inappropriate, like not raunchy inappropriate. But there was one at Valentine's Day that um, you know everybody was sending them. And if I wrote the word Valentine one more time, I was like, come on, why can't anybody ever say love you? But one gal sent one to a girlfriend of hers that said, Daddy's got to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just right up my alley. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, I do a good bit of clever ones for kids that um, can't, like, I, I like this past weekend I did the Black Panther you can't just go to a store and get a Black Panther one, and I can pre like I'll put the picture of projector and I'll type it on. And so the ones that I know that they can't get elsewhere. I, I Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, make sure to follow at Strom EC to tune in next time.